Hello and welcome. Welcome, folks. Welcome, Tech Enthusiasts. Wednesday night live podcast. We are live again two weeks in a row this time. And a special topic, super special guest this week. We're going to be talking all about Anthem Arc, uh, kind of using the Tech Enthusiasm Home Theater as a little bit of a case study. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll take away a bunch of things as well. Probably be running Arc this weekend uh, with some of the guidance and advice and such coming out of this talk. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be it tonight. So a whole lot about ARC. We'll be sharing, we'll be looking, we'll be talking through. Um, I do welcome folks as you're coming in. Uh, hit the like button, please. Leave a comment. Let me know who's out there. Uh, let me know where you're from. Let me know what you've done in your theater lately. Um, if you do have questions tonight, uh, please write a cue. Let it in there. I've got a lot kind of on the itinerary to talk about. So I'll, uh, I'll start questions and what. And of course, um, if you're so kind, super chat, super thanks, and those types of things are always welcome. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Nick Rich from Audio Advice to the screen. Welcome, Nick. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, this, this will be good. Anthem Arc is always a, an interesting topic. I've been into the Anthem gear pretty pretty heavily for a couple of years now. And of course, just put the 90, the ABM 90 in the room a couple of weeks ago. And it's been been fantastic. The audio and the space has never been better, I think. Oh yeah. I mean, we're huge fans of Arc. I mean, we're we're constantly getting our hands on, you know, some of the betas and and everything and uh yeah, we yeah, we put it in probably more theaters than you know most other most other receivers. Um so, yeah, we're constantly constantly working with it. I see Youth Man's here as well in the chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Youth Man. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll gather up our collection of usual friends and uh friends and community members and yeah, and hopefully this proves very useful to a lot of a lot of folks. So, yeah, uh, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Talk about what you do. Yeah. So, you? Uh, yep, I'm our uh, lead theater designer on our online side. So I work one on one with clients, develop custom rooms, develop uh, you know everything from the seating to the speaker placement to acoustics to this, that, and another. And so uh, everything down to electrical and room construction. So you know a little bit of everything. So we specifically work with customers who are do it themselves. Um, or they have a contractor on hand that's uh, that's going to be installing some of the equipment. So, you know, we kind of go all around. And, um, you know, we also have our standard chat and support team who are just full of absolute experts. So whenever we get art questions, not only am I answering those, our entire team is. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're super excited. Excellent. <clears throat> all right. Um, so let me, we'll, we'll share a little bit here. We can look through some things to set a little bit of context as well. Some of the stuff we'll be showing, we'll, we will go through uh, like essentially my last ARC file as both a demonstration of the tool and, and the things that we can do and, and look at some guidance and so on. Um, for folks that may not be familiar, I got a whole bunch of pictures of the room here, but um, we'll kind of be talking kind of from the perspective of, of my theater. So uh, to set some context, there's a single row, we got five seats, those are the audio advice revelations. I was going to say those look really nice. <laughs> familiar, do they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What yeah, do you I've think about super, them so far? Super happy, oh, super happy with them. Yeah, adding, changing over from the couch to the seats uh, was one of one of many transformative upgrades to the theater, um, in my opinion. So I love sitting up higher, like addressing the screen better. Super comfortable. Mm -hmm. It really just changed changes the profile of the room. Oh yeah, so, the motorized uh, headrest looks like you got it up already on there. That's a <laughs> yep. game changer. Yeah, that's my my full memory setting. So I leave the I leave the headrest and the lumbar where I like them, and I just <laughs> put the foot up and down to get in and out. Awesome. So the rest of the theater, of course, is a seven point four point four now. Actually, I don't have a good picture of the. Oh, sorry, I know what I'm looking for. I can find it in the. We've got the got four subwoofers sitting in all the corners, so that the configuration, everything we're looking at, is based on that. All the in-wall speakers behind the screen. So some of the things that we'll be talking about when we're looking at the ARC file again is kind of specific to my room. We'll try to generalize things as well, but keep in mind that um, some of the things that you might want to do in ARC Genesis are, are maybe specific to your your room and your needs, right? Mm -hmm. Nick? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's as much as I would like there to be some you know, blanket feature that we could, you know, turn on and it immediately just makes the room absolutely better. It's that's usually not going to be the case. Every room's different. And if there is something that can be, you know, used across all rooms, Arc's probably already thought about it. Those guys are, uh, you know, Anthem's much smarter than me, uh, their entire team of people. So they've already 
probably already considered it, but there are a few things that we can do to kind of custom tailor taste or, you know, that, that you can help just change the sound to what you like the best. All right. You know, and I didn't grab the microphone. I was going to bring the microphone in the stand up. Um, any, any quick, I guess, starter tips to kind of working with, with the mic and the, it's nice that they give a stand. I think that's one of the yeah. pros. Yeah, that's one thing a lot of people don't realize. It, it comes with a really good quality stand because, you know, coming from, a you know, I use Dirac in my house. I mean, I've, I've tried Arc in here. I've tried all kinds of stuff. Currently, I'm just using Dirac. But, um, you know, from those mics, they lower quality mics typically from from Dirac products. And Anthem used to have, you know, lower quality mics they currently have. So it comes with a good quality mic and a good quality mic stand. So you really don't you don't, you can't use another mic, but you don't have the need to really use another mic either. Um, and the mic stand, you don't have to go on Amazon and order one or, you know, try to try your best to hold it and not move and <laughs> do all that. Yep. And then one of the key elements of the mic, right, is the the little dot always mm -hmm. facing forward. Right? That, yep. That's for impulse or? Yeah, with high frequencies. And so okay. typically high frequencies. And so they found that that was really the best use case uh, for that. So you always want to keep that dot facing forward uh, towards your screen. Super, super important to do that. Um, so that's going to help you out overall. All right. So one of the, I think one of the coolest features, and I think one of the features I'd love to see them do more with as well uh, is quick measure. And so um, mm -hmm. with with the stream and, and having the microphone for the stream, I can't necessarily hook up the microphone and get and show kind of quick measure, but um, I did want to talk about it for a little bit because to me, I think it's one of the tools that's simplified my use of the theater with Anthem stuff. Um, there's a whole lot more we can do in a tool like REW, um, but man, there's a question right there. But I think quick measure actually fulfills a lot of that. Any thoughts on, on quick measure? Yeah, so quick, so yeah, quick measure is really important. Um, you know, if you're going to be running uh, you know, REW, you're going to be running like a parametric EQ, any of that stuff, do it ahead of time. Uh, you know, when it comes down to your levels and really your sub placement, I use quick measure quite a bit. Uh, so quick measure is super powerful for uh, sub placement. So you can see your response inside the room, play around with different sub placement, give it a shot. Um, you know, when it comes down to the uh, level matching, there's a few things that I, I always use quick measure for that. Yep. You can see right here. And so I think the picture may be slightly cut off, but there's also whenever you're calibrating your subs, there's a uh, an average that you're going to see down in the bottom corner. And a lot of people make this mistake. And, you know, admittedly, I made the mistake uh, you know, quite a few times. Yeah, it's not showing it on here. Whenever it's playing, it'll have an average in the bottom right hand corner. We don't go off of that. So we really want to use our peaks and find exactly you know where that is. So typically for two subs, you're shooting for around 71 dB. For, um, you know, for a target of a combined 74, um, yeah, right around 74, 75, somewhere right in there. Uh, for four subs, Jeremy, what did what did you end up setting your subs at? Uh, so I, I, I was going down towards like 66, right? You mm -hmm. go 3 dB per, yep. per extra yep. sub, essentially. Yep. So, yeah, go ahead and have your subs dialed in volume, uh, volume range. If not, Arc's going to yell at you anyway. Um, so that's something to definitely consider. Also, a little side note, and that's that's a general overview of quick uh, quick measure. Uh, I also like to use it uh, once you're done. We'll go after this. Um, you know, we'll talk kind of about through the process, but once you're done, you can go back and check your corrected. Uh, once once you have art correction on, um, you can go back through and check it through quick measure. But one note that you have, you know, back to the mic. Since I think Jeremy, you're a Mac user, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that a lot of people, um, or not a lot of people, we've had some issues with, uh, are the USB dongles. And so we've had some funky issues with that and gain. Um, Ooh, so I, yeah, I, I've noticed that as of recent. So, um, that was actually something we were troubleshooting the system. We could not figure it out. Uh, and one of our sales guys, Michael, who's an absolute expert in this stuff, uh, came back and told us, he said, you know, we called ARC and it was actually an issue or we called Anthem and it was actually an issue with the, um, USB-C converter. So yeah. that's something to keep in mind. What we were seeing with that is it was pushing all of the target curves up to about a hundred TB. And I was oh, like, wow. well, that's, that's a really <laughs> high target curve. And I was like, right, he right. was using super efficient speakers. Like, There's no way that's doing that. But, um, yeah, it's something that you can always detect early on in, um, 
in quick measure as well. So if you're having anything that's funky with the speaker, that's always where I go to kind of troubleshoot it. So I don't have to run through arc and do all that and figure it out in the end. You can figure out, make sure everything's working, make sure that you don't have a uh, jumper off of your speakers uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and things along those lines. Yeah. I love the, that the microphone is USB-C. I do. Yeah. I use a converter usually, um, especially for being farther away. So I, I tend to run the, run the, run the included wire, mm -hmm. which is USB-A. And then I run that even through, um, like a, a USB extension to get mm -hmm. outside the room, usually like sitting outside the room with the door closed. Right? So we're going to talk about and, that, uh, okay. about being outside the room. So mm. this was, um, which do we go ahead? Do you want to go ahead and start kind of talking about, you have some of the, the measurements? Cause I want to, I want to touch on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, let, let's table that. One of the things since I have this up, so these are just yeah. screen grabs, um, from former quick measures. And I was curious, what you had mentioned was, was kind of provocative, mm -hmm. right? So this is a sweep of one of my subs, essentially. I think this is the one in the front left, currently a SBS SB16. Mm -hmm. So you can see that it's reading as 81 dB down there, but the, yeah. until we get to about, what is this, uh, 30 hertz or so, 20, mm -hmm. 35 hertz, we're running upwards of 90. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned kind of not necessarily adjusting to the number in the bottom right but looking towards the peaks so like mm -hmm. what what would you do with this or how how would what well, would you look to do with this given the adjusted volume i guess yeah i mean given that that one is you know closer was that like 20 probably 20 to 30 hertz probably 25 to 30 somewhere right in there if i had to guess yeah um you know i would probably go just under that uh since that's just so low i mean the average almost kind of works out on this where 81 81's about right here. Yeah, yeah, eighty one's really about right because you've got that big peak and it's so low. Um, are these corner loaded? They're they're in the corners, yep. Or yeah. just outside the corners, but in in the vicinity that they're they're benefiting from the corner. Yeah, which you're getting a bit of gain out after that. Um, you know, honestly, I think the average is kind of hitting on on the nose here because um, most of your your really big peak is right there around kind of the one to two hundred range. And also just under that around 80, which is kind of going up right around the 87 level. Um, I would probably go off of that peak. So that's mm -hmm. right around. Sorry, it's kind of hard to see on my screen. I'm probably yeah. giving the, the, the audience, a, <laughs> <laughs> audience a really close view. So it looks like you're probably closer to around 87 there. Um, at that primary peak right around 80 hertz. That's what I would go off of if I were running the... Um, the quick measure you look like you're right off at 87 so i would probably level right around there got it yeah i think i ended up turning these down the svs's i, I turned down pretty significantly almost 14 db yeah because you're probably so. going off of the 81 which yep that's probably the case um how how do you like to w when you have a sub like that sb16 or the other ones in my room are the arndall's 1723s they all have multiple of their own peqs do you mm -hmm. do you prefer to do that? Do you do you prefer to do that ahead of arc? How do, how do you how do you integrate the sub PEQ with the depends tools? on the person doing it. Um, not to say that you know customers don't know what they're doing, but you know you do have a chance to start to mess with some yeah you know, mess with the physics of the sub once you kind of get into it, and then arc starts messing with it. Um, you know if if you're not experienced messing with PEQs, um, and I'll yeah you know, admittedly say I'm not the best at you know, messing with PEQs to get a perfectly flat response. Um, yeah, you know, I would recommend not messing with it uh, yeah. in, unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Otherwise, Arc's going to do a great job. Uh, but if you know what you're doing, you're comfortable with you know, parametric EQs, you're comfortable with mini DSP, uh, run that ahead of time. Uh, now, when it comes down to phase, things like that, I personally would let Arc do that. Uh, because mm -hmm. once you start introducing too many things into uh, mini DSPs, you start creating delays, which ultimately makes kind of sluggish base yeah, interesting yeah that's i i do have a i i did run a little I just the nice thing about this stuff is you really can't break too much right you can only mm -hmm. make it sound sound bad i suppose so if you do something and uh, you you have the ability to go back and do it again so multiple save files too is yep. the uh you know especially with with arc you know your ears the the, the main tool that you have here. I mean, of course you can measure the room, but at the end of the day, it's your room. Enjoy it. <laughs> do, do what you like yeah, to right. do with it. The other thing that kind of 
concerns me with doing PEQs in the subs is if I did those, I pretty much am only doing them at like the MLP, mm -hmm. but ARC is measuring all of these other locations. And so how do you know if you turned something down just at the MLP, you're not actually pulling something down that may be more of a null in another seat? Mm -hmm. Is that, that a realistic fear, I guess? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's why we can't, you know, tuned down to the finest point you know it sounds like theoretically we could make the you know perfect curve in a room absolutely flat but the reality of the situation is whenever you make one change in one position you're either making a change in another or you're making another change in you know at some other point in the frequency because you're you know you're altering it so you know a woofer can only do so much before it's either you're overexerting it or you're overexerting the amplifier um so yeah, exactly what you're saying. I would probably let Arc, uh, you know, handle all of that. Cool. Um, one of the other things that I just had recently learned about Quick Measure as well, I can use this sweep to show it, is when you're all done, and you go back to Quick Measure and you run Quick Measure with the Arc corrections on, it will show you like the sub integrated like completely integrated sweep with your subs and your speakers. I thought that was that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's a great visualization. So this this is actually the LCRs in my room, all sub uh, af after the current um, after the current arc run. So um, again, I think I, I think I think quick measure is just invaluable. Yeah, um, one of those one of those parts of the tool. I hope they do they do even more with give us more more things and the snapshots and all that stuff. Yeah, I think yeah. that one thing we've been asking for is, you know, for, for four subs to be able to do a quick measure of all four at the same time. Um, I think that that would, and and they they listened to it, so they took it down as a note. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll happen. Yep, yeah, they're definitely still working on it. There was actually a Anthem firmware, I think, today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that you know, there's just a big kudos too for how smooth the software runs. If, have have you run other, uh, you know, room correction softwares inside of your room? Um, I had Morant stuff before the Anthem, so Odyssey is what I've had the most experience kind of playing with prior to this. Mm -hmm. And were you running it on your computer or straight through the uh, processor? Through the processor, and when I had it, that was that was two years ago. So um, I, I did a little bit with the apps, but the whole like the whole like better multi EQ app, I think mm -hmm. was either just brand new um, or soon became available after I had made the upgrade away from the brand. So I've not, mm -hmm. I've never used anything else actually firsthand as, as powerful as this. I did have a trend off for a little while on a demo. So I, I, oh, awesome. get, I got the chance to play with their optimizer, but that was also mm -hmm. a couple years back, right? At the yeah. So not as user friendly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. So, where should we go here? Let's um, maybe we should load up and load up the file and kind of walk through the options here. So this is yeah. a this is basically a copy uh, of the last measurements that I did. But let's jump all the way kind of to the start here. Mm -hmm. Let me zoom this up a little bit and talk a little bit about what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So basically, this is where we're deciding what configuration we have and. Uh, yeah, so it looks like you're running, yeah, 744. Four. Yep. Yep, 744. Four. Yep, so this is where we're going to go ahead and just put in our configuration, determine whether we want to do different types of measurements. Uh, so different measurements. Measurement A, I think it allows up to four various mm -hmm. measurements. I, I can't imagine a, a use case for all four of them. Uh, <laughs> the most common ones that we see are A, um, having a measurement for you know, your standard listening and your main listening position and two channel. That's a big one. Uh, the other is for uh, one or two rows. And so the way that we typically do it is, you know, running one primary row. So if we have two rows, this is what I usually suggest, run the main primary row. And then we do a secondary where we run the primary row plus the secondary. So mm -hmm. instead of just running you know, instinctually you'd think, hey, I would want to run my first one here, my second one back there, but we want to have a you know solid cover of the room. So for one row, I usually recommend five uh, measurement positions. There are use cases where you use more, but that's for longer seating. But we want to say that mm -hmm. each measurement is going to have roughly two feet between it. 
um, which we're, we'll kind of get into the you know, mic positions and things like that. But for the most part, you want to take the length of your seating area and say, or at least occupied seating area and say, hey, what's every two feet of that? Uh, so for the most part, that works out to about five measurements on a standard you know, standard couch. Um, but the uh, the main listening position is going to be your absolute absolute most important. So make sure you get that right and follow the steps we were talking about before. Um, other use cases could be if uh, if you have different positionings or different uh, use cases for your two channel system. So you know if you have you know back row listening for your two channel system front versus front row, pretty rare, but yeah, we've we've done it before. Hmm. Yeah, the one thing that I've been debating to use two measurements for is to do a solo, solo in a group, basically, because mm -hmm. there there are times where I'm the only one sitting down in the theater, and then, of course, other times where it's the whole family or, yeah, or, or other folks that are over. I, I wonder. I, I haven't done it to really test it to see, but I, I wondered how much like splitting hairs that is. Like how how much better can it really be? To, usually to that. usually it's it, i noticed the most in the low frequencies but then again that's really mm -hmm. what room correction is is doing i've noticed changes in the uh you know especially if your back rows closer to a wall uh mm -hmm. so let's say that your back rows less than three feet from a wall which is i usually don't take recommend taking measurements much closer than three feet to a back wall or else this is going to happen you're going to lose a lot mm -hmm. of base and so whenever you take two rows and one's closer to a boundary that's going to ultimately end up happening Another question I get a lot is kind of about right now we've got sort of four subwoofers in my space and they happen to be relatively in the same positions that are shown here. Mm -hmm. um, but the 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 visualization is not necessarily have to correspond to the reality of of the things in your yep. room. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is just a this is just a visualization. You know, if you have your, you know, side surrounds at 110 degrees versus 90 as they're shown here it's it doesn't mean oh i've got this wrong and i have to you know reset up the entire system or anything like that um but yeah that's just a general guidance um you know and a lot of people end up making the mistake of uh putting dolby enabled speakers and that's why i like having this visualization because they're, they're, they'll say oh well i have or atmos enabled um yeah and or middle dolby atmos or something like that and they're like okay well i i have that these are dolby atmos speakers instead of in ceiling speakers and so that's why it's great to have the visualization there in the front any tips around the front distance setting this is one that you want to make sure to get or yeah you, you, you want to get it you want to get it right <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh yeah it's just you're from your main listening position to your uh front left and so you want to make sure that you get that as spot on as yeah as you can um one thing that I always carry around whenever I'm uh, working on systems or just in general is a laser measure. So I typically yep. use that. Uh, yep. Just go from the head. Stick and, it right on your forehead. Yeah. Stick it right on my forehead. Otherwise, you know, you can get a yeah, measuring tape and do it, but it's, it's, it just depends, I guess, on the length. <laughs> so yeah, either one works perfectly fine, but yep. Just make sure you're accurate with this. My main, uh, main suggestion there. Right, so from here, once you once you've kind of decided your measurements, I love the naming too. I, I'm a I'm I'm kind of an OCD type person, so I, I appreciate being able to, <laughs> to rename you, things to my liking. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So you can yeah you can name it down to yeah you know, if you have one row, two rows, and so you don't have to yeah you know, play the guessing game on which one's which or go back and look at it. You can you know say two channel or singular. Which this is something that's kind of interesting. I was talking to Anthem about this. Um, you know th they were saying that you don't necessarily need to have a secondary measurement for two channel if nothing's changing outside of that, uh, mm -hmm. which we've always done it. But yeah, this was something we were talking about recently. They were saying that your measurements should be fairly consistent. If you're not changing, you know, the subwoofers in your front speakers, if you're just going, changing the mode to stereo and going through it, it's, it's really not going to make too much of a difference if you're not taking into consideration, you know, if you're mm -hmm. not changing the focus of your main seating area. Got it. Yeah, you can change, you could do speaker selections in the profile too, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so from here we'd go to measure. We're not going to go to measure, but let's come back to this picture of the seating row. We mm -hmm. can talk a bit about mic positioning and other other aspects. Mm -hmm. um, so 
probably one of the most <laughs> the most critical aspects. If if we were measuring this row, um, say let's say individually first, and then for the group five points, where are we putting that mic? So individually, yeah, you know, for for your standard seating area, I typically do measure you know an area around it. So if if it's just one person, you could do three measurements and still measure around that area because you're getting you're gathering extra data. Uh, that's one way of doing it. But for the most part, you're going to be measuring out the entire row for most people because they're going to have four seats that said, hey, you know, I'm going to have somebody in one of these given seats at any time, unless you're mm -hmm. like me who uses their theater. <laughs> just like, just by myself. No, uh, <laughs> it's either me or yeah, me and my girlfriend. Um, but, you know, I would recommend measuring the listening position for you know every single seat because it looks like your seat's you've got two feet, even your closest seats are probably still two feet apart from center of headrest to center of headrest. Um, the other thing we want to make sure is that our back speakers aren't being blocked by the microphone. Now I kind of follow, and if, mm. if any of you have run a Trinov measurement, they recommend reclining all of their seats and making sure there's a clear, you know, clear line of sound straight to the microphone. There's a little bit, you know, their mic's of course different to multi-array versus this being single point. But generally we want to have the seats uh, or the microphone over the seats clearing straight to the speakers by about six inches. Um, so mm -hmm. the easiest way I find doing that is reclining the seats if we don't want to raise that up because there's an argument to be said, well, my ears aren't actually above the yeah, seats. Up, up here. Yeah. So otherwise you're kind of factoring in false absorption you know, things like that. But for the most part, we want to make sure that we have a clear line of clear line of sound to our back speakers. Uh, I've heard it both ways and I've heard great arguments uh, opposing both, but I think it makes the most sense to take an accurate measurement with a clear line of sound. Otherwise your high frequencies mm -hmm. are going to be rolled off. Interesting. I wonder if that actually is, is there's a little bit of at play in my file. Cause I think on that last measurement, I kind of was, I, I'd say I had the microphone a little more at, at ear level, which is mm -hmm. down in front of the headrest versus, although I, I believe I did tilt back a little bit, but yeah, maybe, maybe I would, the right decision is a compromise between the two, put it back a little, and, but bring it up a little too. Mm -hmm. So there's arbitrary placement inside of ARC, and that's what we were kind of talking about before this, is that ARC will say, I ah, will place it here, you know, here, here. Those are not, I mean, they're, they're guidelines if you, you know, want to follow it exactly, but there are better ways of doing it, especially for dedicated theaters. Um, you also want to try to simulate it as much as how you're going to be using the room. So we were, we were talking about this because I was saying that whenever I run these remotely, I'll typically have the customer walk out of the room, place the mic, come back. And they were saying, Hey, it's actually better to have the people in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. so, cause you're, you're adding mass to the room and therefore you're frequency response are going to change based off of whether you're in the room or not, uh, as long as you're not blocking a speaker, of course. So if okay. you're not, yeah, as long as you're not between the microphone and a speaker, Anthem actually suggested people being in the room because it changes, um, changes metric, which I think is interesting. Hmm. Um, outside of that, a lot of the issues that we see when people say, oh, my system sounds funky is due to measurements that are too close together. Uh, I would personally think that more measurements the better, you know, off of just a you know, initial thought, but it's not, you're going to end up getting some funky curves and typically it's going to occur during the, occur in the high frequency. Um, but yeah, you're gonna get some funky curves based off of taking your measurements too close together. So if we did this row, then five measurements, of course, MLP center seat, that's, that's, yep, the, that's the that's most the important money seat right there. That's number yep. one. And then, so essentially you're saying, go, go right on each seat. Number two, Number three, number That's four. That's the way number that I would five. do it. Yep. And then if you were going to go to the other row, I would keep that as measurement A just for mm -hmm. your primary. And then for measurement B, I would take 10 measurements. Let's say that both rows are identical. Uh, do the same thing. So one for each row. Um, oh, I just, I had a, a an extent. Oh, the, my, my next question too then. So with, with, Everything after number one being arbitrary, it also doesn't matter two through five, which seat we're measuring, right? Is it that, that no, point, it's, it's, it's all, all data. data? Yeah, it's all just data. So it's, you know, it's just adding more, you know, just a more comprehensive picture. But yeah, you don't want to get too many or else you start really overloading the processing. Um, so, you know, again, don't try to take measurements all the way <laughs> you know, <laughs> around the seats every, you know, every square inch. But yeah, there, it really doesn't matter what order you do it. Um, 
doesn't matter the exact position. And that really that goes for virtually all room correction software is another thing. So DRX the same exact way. Yeah, that that was a huge learning point or adjustment point kind of from what I was doing when I first got it to the mm -hmm. figuring more. You're taking stuff like out. the measurement by the knee and everything too. You're like, all right, is that is that kind of how it goes? <laughs> yeah. 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 The thing about being in the room is really interesting as well. I'm sure a lot of us have like gone and kind of hid behind the hid behind the seat. <laughs> yep. To be be in the room but feel that we had to get out of the way, right? Or or, or something mm -hmm. like that. So. Yeah, as long as you're not making noise. And you know, this is a really important thing too, is to make sure. Yeah, try to get the best measurement you can. Take the time and get the best measurement. If a dog barks and you're like, Dude, I don't want to run that thing again, you can actually go mm -hmm. back through after it's done if you find something funky in the measurement and rerun specific measurements, but just rerun the measurement. Uh, so make sure all ACs cut off. There's no noise. You know, you're not you know, stepping around while that thing's running. Um, they are super sensitive. So if you can visualize the noise floor, it's, it's going to detect anything you do. Um, and sometimes that's why it's hard for people to be in the room. <laughs> so, uh, but I do, like I said, do recommend being in the room, just being as quiet as possible. Our cats, I don't know what it is. As soon as I press that, that go button, they like to come to the top of the steps and start meowing <laughs> down, down. I know. I think that, that uh, I think my neighborhood has like something instinctual that if, if I, if I need a complete silence for a, uh, for a calibration, either a dog's barking or somebody's mowing their lawn, it, it's, it never fails. <laughs> all right so looking through the, our list of <laughs> michael goddess. said he's he's laid on the floor to get out of the way <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> we're overdoing it i guess just stand just stand to the side comfortably although yeah. these tones get pretty loud as well so yeah um yeah especially the speaker tones versus the subtones I know I'll go around and be messing with systems doing remote calibrations and I'll accidentally scare customers because I'm controlling their controlling their screen. And so I'll be going through and testing each speaker and they won't be expecting it. And I'll, I'll inevitably scare somebody <laughs> each time I do it. So yeah, beware. Beware of that. All right. So if we come back, I guess anything else on the on the logistics? I think we covered that. No, no, like I said, it's just you want to make sure that um you know, you take those as accurately as possible and make sure your position one is correct, dots facing forward and follow that. And if you have questions, you know, Anthem only chooses, you know, the best quality dealers. Um, so I'm not saying that you have to buy from audio advice. Of course, we'd love if you buy from us, but your dealer should have, um, you know, enough knowledge of these to become, to become an Anthem dealer. So always, you know, call your dealers if you have any questions. Um, but if you purchase from us, you know, we can walk you through all this. Well, I'll say that you should buy from Audio Advice, and you should use a Techthusiasm <laughs> affiliate link to do so. Hey, I agree with <clears> you. <right? laughs> it's going to be holiday time, spending time's coming up. <laughs> All right, so we'll yeah. skip over the measurements again. Um, if, if for the folks out there that are new that haven't done it, it'll basically right you, your MLP. You'll do kind of one measurement, then you'll do uh, delays in the same mm -hmm. spot. Then you go to all your locations, and then we'll, we'll talk about phase, what kind of when we get there. But once you're all done, um, you're kind of dumped into this screen. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. So you're seeing all your speakers here, you're seeing all your different measurements. So it looks like, did you do a secondary measurement? Titled? Yeah, this, this one actually, um, I had done three, just only for the purpose of the fact that I have uh, a, a subwoofer test kind of setup going and so mm -hmm. i guess the folks kind of for the purposes of the stream we can kind of ignore the fact that i have uh, extra measurements here labeled svs and arndall those are kind of solely okay. for the purposes of of experimenting and testing around with the subs main yeah. main is my main that's that's everything all four subs and all of that turned on um yeah but you know, yeah, we can we can see all of our speakers going through here, and then this is where it usually at the point where, um, yep, yep. You, oh, so yeah, this is just going showing all the speakers kind of in one area uncorrected is essentially what it, what that was. So in here, you know, actually, I can probably turn this on. We could just show this really quick. So if you did, so here's the difference, right? My my main, um, or the sorry, these are different profiles not mm -hmm. not different measurements one measurement and multiple profiles i just had them i just had them disabled okay yeah so confusing ourselves 
Yeah, turn and right here. Turn all of these on. Sorry, go ahead. I got them all. Yeah, and this is just essentially showing your configurations and which speakers you have in each each setup. So what I was doing with the profile, so we get four measurements that correlate over to four uh, four profiles, and mm -hmm. you can you can mix and match those. So I had profile one essentially had all four subs turned on. I had another profile where I was only using just the two SBS subs, and a third profile where I was using just the R and Ls. So I could kind of sit in the room and switch between the different subwoofers and just kind of play around with the experience of what they were sounding like. Um, in and what space. did you see the difference between using your four versus two in, in your space? Because I know your, your main seating position is closer to the back of the room, correct? Yeah, so the, the room is like 18 feet ish across mm -hmm. and um, I've got about four feet behind the seats. So mm -hmm. 13, 12, 12 and a half feet to the screen. Uh, so the subs in the back are almost kind of like a near field ish Mm -hmm. effect um pretty close to the back of the seats G going to four subwoofers was transformative to the audio mm -hmm. performance of the space uh, just absolutely phenomenal from anything that that two um was able to accomplish so i, I don't think i'll ever have less than four subwoofers in, in the room again and whenever you're running without arc did you feel feel like that there was you could localize your back subs more than your front so i would i haven't done I haven't done experimentation to probably answer that question mm -hmm. too well. And actually, I, honestly, I set this up um, more than I've actually used it. So I think for the most part, minus a little bit of tinkering, we've pretty much just been using the four, the four sub config um, mm -hmm. for for our use of the room. That's that's the downside to doing this kind of as a side gig is I don't I don't have as much time to really really play as I would like to. So, but we've used the room. Since putting the SVS subs in there, we've we watched, I'd say maybe a handful of movies, um, mm -hmm. and actually had had some some friends and family over for a couple of demo opportunities in the last couple of weeks. But I, I've been almost exclusively just running all four, versus doing mm -hmm. any kind of critical comparisons and and whatnot. Yeah, that's a good use case um, for for multi measurements. Um, so that looks good. Um, so jumping over to speaker levels, which would did we answer most of what you were kind of looking for on? on the uh, select speakers. Yep, yep, yep. And I and I think the the main takeaway for folks is like this gives you the, the flexibility in this is is just absolutely profound. And even mm -hmm. later on we can talk about the idea of like uh, tying these to the the whole virtual input thing. It's just, mm -hmm. it's functionality that um, I think is unparalleled. <laughs> yep. And so for speaker level, I mean primarily this is adjusting gain. Um, yeah, we've seen a few different people you know, find tweaks with, you know, adjusting certain levels and pushing it where it's, you know, more along the target curve. But at a fundamental level, this is just adjusting gain. Um, I, do I, do I use it very often? Not really. Um, I typically don't use the speaker level adjustment unless something funky is going on. And then if something funky is going on, then I want to find another use case rather than trying to patch over it in ARC. Mm. But just, everything on yours looks, yeah, it looks right to me. Um, so just kind of show the th that fact, the black line right, is essentially where we're looking to, or where the system is looking to calibrate to. And yep. if we bring these down or bring them up, we're, like you said, we're changing gain and just shifting that curve Yep. up and down. Yeah, and which you've got a pretty good center line through most of yours anyhow. Yeah, this Focal have some some interesting dynamics. The the bigger the IWLCR sixes all have these these rises where the the IW sixes tend not to do that. And in fact, like the IW sixes tend to be quite a bit flatter than the than their larger their larger friends. Were you talking about the and, peak and the lower frequency around? What yep. is that? Yeah, here let me go back up. So the center and the the center and the front right, these are both the IW LCR6, the bigger, and then these surrounds are the smaller IWs. So some of this is still room location. There's still yeah. a little bit of a peak in the 50s there. But I, I noticed the the IW6s tend to always just look a little more flat. They're yeah. not, they're also not behind the screen. So that that could be 
potentially impacting things somewhat, I guess, or. Yeah, it's probably, I mean, I would, I would assume it's the room. Um, and whenever arc, I assumed arc turned that down since it's below what well, you're below your 5k at least. Um, yeah. So these, these are in this file, it's a result of having kind of gone ahead and come back a mm -hmm. little bit. So, um, Usually, it, when I when I run it, I guess like you said, right? You kind of almost skip right through here more to the to the targets, and then mm -hmm. from there the calculations are ran. So it's more of something to kind of inspect before you. This isn't maybe the first place to start tweaking, right? If you're going to no, no, it's not the first place you want to start tweaking. I mean, you definitely want to go over to your targets first and look through and see if there's anything really funky going on. Um, you know, all your initial measurements. Yeah, those those are kind of just to look at it and say, oh, my room's not not too great, or notice if anything really out out of the normal is happening. But for your speaker levels, going through and looking at those, I keep those stock unless I need to come back to them. My room, I think, is a textbook example of having having the subwoofers working together in concert because if you look where mm -hmm. certain subs peak and other subs know their they're they're diametrically opposed with each other um, in a lot of cases. So there's definitely subwoofers that are kind of carrying 50 hertz where others are are dipping much harder at 50. And then, you know, other other I said speaker, other subwoofers that are carrying low frequencies, right? Where others are low. Um, so it was definitely a very, very positive added added additive effect. Yeah. Um, in the space. And that's that's just off of your five measurements on your on your back row, or, or is your back row your only row? Yeah, just just one row. Yep, just okay, one row. Gotcha. All right, so let's go to the top. Oh wait, it's going to jump me through. So this is the other thing too with the profiles is you can tweak them independently. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to have different different adjustments to to be able to compare against each other, you can do that very easily. Yeah, it, it's great for people who like to like to tweak and play around with different setups. It's not common for for a lot of people, but also audio files. You never know. <laughs> yeah, there's there's by far more going on in this file than I generally do. Like I said, mo in most cases, I, I don't even necessarily have the the worry about um, or concern about doing a single focused measurement versus a group because I don't even want to bother necessarily changing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather just kind of have one thing that's the default. It, I, I feel confident about it. It's set, it's good, and it applies to all inputs and, and use of the room. Because I know for sure, like, the family's not going in there to say, oh, dad used this last. We should put it to a group setting. They wouldn't even know <laughs> what that what that meant. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's not, you know, I, I kind of wish there was an easier way to set that up, which with, I guess with automation, there's probably a way to do it. Um, yeah. But you know, just off of the get-go, there's really not a super easy way to switch between those for the uh, for the average person. But again, you know, I don't think this is a, it's a switch that you're making every other time you're going to be in the room. So, right. yeah, but it, it would be something worth looking into to see if you could automate that. Yeah, that's one thing I was I was thinking about doing that really just for the content, if if not for my mm -hmm. real day-to-day -day use of the room. If there was a way to like. Set that up. Set up that concept of the individually calibrated profile versus the group profile. Mm -hmm. Push that through to a virtual to virtual inputs. So you've got an Apple TV for solo, Apple, excuse me, TV for group, Kaleidoscape solo, Kaleidoscape group, and then if those were, say, presented in the watch list of the Control Four interface, mm -hmm. then now you're literally one click, right, one one click away. I'm sure it could be done. Um, it's a matter of figuring out more. I think the how do you make that present in Control Four? Um, yeah, so I might do that just for the content eventually. But no, you absolutely should. I think a lot of people would be interested in that. <clears throat> All right. So here, here's the. This is really the money screen, right? I think of the whole, the whole deal. So both where you can have the most fun, maybe do the most damage, and um, so yeah. Now, well, this is a section that you know you definitely want to. There's a few things you can play with. Knowing what you play with is half of the battle for for some people. Um, you know, the typical pieces that we look at are room gain, deep bass boost, and tilt level, which are their very first three uh, adjustments. From there, we want to kind of look at our maximum corrective frequencies, things along those lines. So, room gain is going to be really, in simple terms, what's known as your mid bass. It's what most people 
uh, associate that with deep base, you know, deep base. Just showing, showing how it works. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Which typically, did you turn your room gain up? Uh, yeah. So I, I've got mine tuned. So we were talking about this as well, the caveat. You may not want to necessarily just copy what you see in the stream here. And, and these yep. are all very specific to, um, to, to your needs, but I, I've been I've been tuning up my base in Arc a good bit. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, my room game comes out at three, um, mm -hmm. and I've got the headrooms usually in the sub performance. Actually, if we look, at the, even the the actual performance lines uh, of a couple of these subwoofers are way even way above there. And so I I, I tend to turn it up. I don't feel I end I, I end up with like bad bass or muddy bass or too much bass. Mm -hmm. doing that so to me that that restores a lot of um low end feel so i i tend to tune tune rune game all the way up to six and then i still mm -hmm. add a little bit of deep bass in there as well yeah and there's something you know, before we kind of go into all this too whenever you first run arc and if you're used to really boomy bass for most clients i say okay i will come back and you know clean it up for you or uh, you know, change it to your liking, but let's wait like mm. one week, <laughs> listen to it, get used to it, and then turn it off. Then turn arc off and see what you think about your base prior. Most people will say, you know what? I actually don't want to touch the system now. Uh, I kind of want to kind of want to leave it where it's at. But if you, you know, listen to a week, your ears kind of get used to it and you're not, you know, used to just the you know one note base anymore, you'll probably end up keeping it where it's at. But with that said, it's been, you know, it's been a week, it's been a month, and you said, all right, I, I want to change some things around. I'm either getting you know, fatigued from my system, I'm not feeling that that punch of my system, or you know, my overall audible base is, is a little bit low. That's whenever you want to start going. The first three things I would do, like I said, adjust room gain, deep bass boost, and I probably wouldn't even touch tilt level unless you really know what, not necessarily know what you're doing. You either have a circumstance that would apply to that, or you say, hey, my system is really bright. And then at that point, we may want to revisit how you measure your system. But for the most part, room gain is going to be your mid base. Deep base boost is, of course, your deep base. That's a lot of where people have changed it based off of either how their room's constructed. So if you're not getting that kind of room feeling from your base, either A, you have concrete floors, uh, which is a really common use case because of, mm -hmm. I work with a lot of basements or... Um, you know, let's say that you have, you know, wood floors on a second story and you need to turn it down. Uh, that's where mm -hmm. you're going to go and adjust your deep bass boost. So that's going to be shaking a lot of the room. Like I said, the audible bass, the mid bass um, is going to be coming from your room gain. And so as, as Jeremy showed, you know, moving that up and down, you can immediately see how it's affecting your curve. Yeah. And my room too is, is a basement room. Um, it's a finished basement. It's, it's, you know, studded out and drywalled. <clears throat> um, two walls of the theater sitting in the seats, the right hand wall and the wall in the back are exterior walls. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, drywall, uh, stud frame, small barrier, and then concrete poured wall. And then my floor, um, and then the other two walls are interior uh, stud walls that go to other parts of the basement. Um, the floor is the slab with and then we have like a, a rubber underlayment we have a mm -hmm. floating uh, hickory wood engineered floor and then on top of that we put the pad in the carpet oh, for wow. the theater um so that might be a reason why I, I find myself wanting to push these numbers up a little bit because being in the basement like that it's a fairly inert <laughs> mm -hmm. space i guess um, yeah yeah and it, you know you want to feel that punch to the system because typically room gain is going to default around three to four, um, which is what Anthem recommends. But like I said, trust your ears. And so you know what you're doing with this. So if you if you turn it up a little bit more and you don't feel like this boomy bass, then it's not boomy bass then. <laughs> then, then you like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, typically you're going to be somewhere around three to four um, to be able to really, um, you know, to be for most, most use cases. I've been around a number of rooms here in the area in the last couple of years as well. And there's definitely some folks that really, really like, I mean, they, they enjoy this hobby in terms of base power, mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, you know, it's, have... it's definitely the most psychological piece behind home theater. I mean, if, if you show people that don't know theater 
you know, very well. If you just put on a track with really deep bass, they're going to like it better than, you know, the most locationally accurate you know, system you've heard. Yeah. Um, but I, I tend to value, say, more of the clarity, clarity and integration than just, than just bass. Mm -hmm. So if, if this gives the indication that I'm, I'm a bass head and I'm, and I'm running this like bloating flat, the, the way that it presents in the room is, is in my room, at least in particular, is not, not that at all. Mm -hmm. um, so the, these controls on the left move us up and down. The ones on the right kind of move the points left and yeah, right. It's the point, it's the centered point. Uh, so it moves that left to right. Like I said, if I typically would not touch those, um, mm -hmm. you know, arc does a fantastic job straight out the gate with that uh some people will move it around just depending on uh you know, typically with subwoofers they'll start messing with it a little bit more but um for the most part i would leave those kind of as is um examples of where you would want to want to adjust it um you know if you have a section where you're let's see on yours, there's really not as much, but it's really more about crossover, um, mm -hmm. which you're set right at about, what's your crossover, right around 80 on these? Yeah, it, mine, it calculates everything at 80 except two of the uh, top speakers. It, it chooses 90. Yeah, yeah, so you really don't want to mess with those on yours. Did you end up touching those at all? No, I've never, I've never changed the crossovers in any of my, my arc results. I just leave those yeah. as, as it finds them. Yeah. Arc usually does a, does a fairly good job. A lot of people will try to make their own house curve with it, kind of make it look like the Harmon curve. It's really, mm. I personally would not try to follow that on arc. Um, on Dirac, you can load in the, the Harmon curve. You don't want to try to mimic any particular Harmon curve on these, um, or it's just not going to work out the way you want it to. Mm. All right, so we look at one of the let's look at the speakers and some of the options that are on the speakers there. So these are yep fronts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, eighty hertz on these. Everything is eighty except for a couple of the tops. Mm -hmm. Which you have you have an AT screen is what we were discussing. Correct. Yep. So, so that's fine. yep that's one of the kind of blanket uh, reasons I would recommend changing the next setting we're going to talk about, which is your maximum your maximum correct correction frequency. Uh, typically whenever we start to change uh, anything above 5k, we're getting into speaker correction. And so that's correcting the speaker itself rather than correcting for the room or how it's interacting with the room. So you can't really change. It's not recommended to change the speaker itself from this level because physics, you're trying to beat physics at that point. Now with screens, we've seen high frequencies dropped down, you know, seven DB yours really, I mean, are you, you running a woven screen or a micro yeah, it's a it's a Seymour center stage XD. Yeah. So woven it's not here. doing a ton to the high frequencies. It doesn't, at least not in the vocal range as much. It looks like you got a slight dip around 2K, but, yeah. uh, and then slightly around, what is that, like 15K? Yep. Yeah. So slightly around 15K. So it's not that big of a drop. Um this is one of those situations where I would say run it with and run it without and mm -hmm. see if you see a difference in the width of your sound stage. Um, because that's sometimes what it can end up doing is compressing the sound stage and making it sound much more narrow uh, mm -hmm. than it should once you correct all the way up to 20 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Um, so I would give it a shot at 5K, save one file and then save a second one, correct it all the way up to 20K and let your ear decide. Yeah, I, I, I did that when I first got the 70 a couple of years ago. I did a little experimenting around like that. Um, but prob probably do to do it again with the, the changes that have happened since. Yeah. Cause if you had the, um, it depends on how many years ago they used to not even allow correction at all past 5k. Mm. So I think that started with arc Genesis, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was, and it was two, two years, two years ago was when I, when I got my first ABM. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that I have there is like, if you, if you take this speaker response, right. And we leave it, we leave it at 5k. We're kind of like correcting, correcting, correcting. We can, this, it'll bring this hump down. And then immediately after 5k, this, right, the speaker will go and we're kind of like popping up. Does that create any kind of a, I don't know, discontinuity as well? So I don't know exactly what arc does on that side. I would, I would assume it's not going to be an immediate jump up. I feel like it would probably be more 
gradual. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, it's hard to see because we have people adjust tilt. And that's another thing about tilt that we didn't really talk about. If you're sitting there adjusting your tilt curve and you don't have your maximum correction frequency yep. you know, all the way up, you're really not doing much. Um, right. So this is where that starts to come into play. Now, I don't think that it's going to create that much of it. I feel like they would have thought that out or that would be pretty audible if it goes to 5K and then you have a massive jump and it immediately changes. Um, mm. I want to say it's more audible or more gradual than that. Um, but that's a good question. Well, I need to need to ask Anthem about it. But for the most part, uh, on the average system, I would not... You know, just to sum it up, I would not change maximum maximum corrective frequency to 20K unless there's something really funky going on. Like you have a 10, 10 dB drop. You know, in this case, it looks like we're not going much more than three to five um, up there. It looks yeah. like only about three. Uh, like three like kilohertz, 70 to three 65 dB. here to here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a high range. Again, try it with, try it without. Um we could just be squashing our front sound stage if we're not careful. Mm. So the center is pretty, pretty similar um, results and performance and correction the same way. The other speakers is where I was still doing, I was still taking these higher, particularly because of these, these rises, Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out kind of what's, what's the right thing to do. It's just so nice and flat, like right through so much of this, these Mm -hmm. IW sixes, and then they just go, (laughs) Mm-hmm. They they go off um, up there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is a good argument to try it. But I again, I still probably wouldn't try to change the voice of the speaking speaker too much. Um, this could be the use case where you adjust your level a little bit. But mm. you know, again, I don't I don't think it's really necessary to uh, to try to tame that too much. Um, Again, another one where I would try it with and try it without. Uh, the other thing we didn't talk about is the sin based to subwoofer. I see people mm-hmm. try to say, "Hey, I've got big old honking front speakers. I want to, you know, want to keep my bass still." You know, again, that's another situation where you'd still want to keep that stock sin the bass of the sub. Yeah, those are. I don't think I've ever touched that or the or the roll off as well. No, uh, again, uh, the high frequency roll off. I've seen people, you know, mess with those before. Um, if they're correcting on, uh, you know, up to twenty k, but for the most part, it's not something you want to. You, you really need to mess with. So let's go down. So these, so the the side surrounds. I I had been taking them out. The heights, less so. I'd still been going. I was going up to ten here again because. Just these focals, they kind of all have this kind of like similar, the focals plus my room, I should say, um, have these kind of similar responses where we're peaking up, although the the in ceilings tend to die off a little nicer rather than just continuing to mm-hmm. continuing to rise right, right through there. But that's definitely something to, to play yeah. with. Yeah, I think that 5K is probably going to be, I think you're, you'd probably be fine with 5K on there. Um, but again, something to something to try which i'm sure have you played around with multiple iterations on these to to try the correction the correction frequency so far how do you mean iterations like to in the software to kind of go back and forth and move them yeah up save like multiple yeah. different files and try it out yeah a little bit i'm, I'm probably due for for more of that <laughs> right subs um so looking at your subs here, so the, it generates the curve based off of your subwoofers uh, in this yeah. case. You know, I've seen a lot of different uh, adjustments on here. Of course, starting out with just like phase, we don't want to touch that. We're going to ultimately, it's 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 going to do the work for you. So don't mm-hmm. touch phase. Um, your low frequency uh, extension slope, I typically keep that flat. One of the cases that I was talking about where you would probably want to adjust these are your... Um, if you have near field subs, so are subwoofer one, is that your front or this back? is front left? Yeah. Front one and two left. are front three and four are back. Okay. So yeah, in this case, I probably wouldn't touch these, um, for the average person. I don't think there's really much of a necessity. Let's go to your back subs and see. So th- these aren't specifically near field. Uh, when I made, and I made that comment earlier, I'd say they're kind of like pseudo near field just because it's, it's one row and they are behind, but 
there's still a good whatever two two three feet i, I do have them against the wall versus like up close to the back mm -hmm. of the seating part of that too is because it's five seats so it's it's a bit of a wide row mm -hmm. I, I debated like if I, if I brought them close for a near field where would i actually put them that they you know might might serve effectively to the whole row with only two units mm -hmm. so i just i just let, kind of left them um against the wall but they are, they are definitely much closer to the seating than the front of course mm -hmm. yeah i mean really both of your subs there's really not any need to make uh any major changes but in some cases uh we can have spikes that are more audible in the subwoofer making the you know certain subs more locationally accurate um, or if we have, you know, a big dip at you know, certain frequencies or a big spike, um, we can adjust those. But again, our right out, right out of the gate does a fantastic job of kind of tuning everything down, um, and doing the sub curve automatically. I rarely have to touch sub curves, but again, some people are really tweaky. Want to try it out. If you find something that works and you say, Hey, this, this worked fantastic for a room. Let us know. I, I always want to check that out. Uh, but for the most part, I never have to touch these yeah i love how it it kind of basically does a best fit right and mm -hmm. and makes makes a makes a curve that makes sense yeah for your subwoofer yeah have you done any changes to these that you've noticed anything that's actually improved it because i'm yet to find no. anything no I've, I've not really gotten too too tweaky um mm -hmm. the most that i've played with is to say maybe to just experiment so if we go forward from here you know let me go back one thing just to make this quicker uh, sorry i want to turn i just want to turn these other profiles off um is coming through the targets is all right you got to click all the way through levels targets so oh, we got it's kind of a bug we had a little bug going on Oh, I was just talking about how reliable the software was. Yeah, I know. We all let's go we'll jump here. So after all of that stuff, right, the corrections are made. Um, sometimes I, I think I will, folks will kind of look at some of these results and jump back, right, back to the levels. Mm -hmm. And you could maybe raise or lower a little bit to get these curves a little flatter mm -hmm. is that is that a, that a bad thing to do or is that like kind of manually iterating and helping the software do you think so i've i've heard both takes on it i talked to anthem about this um you know specifically to say you know is, is level adjustment the right thing to do they said you know primarily you're boosting gain um you know you're adjusting the level of that speaker but if it makes the curve look better, I'm I'm still almost inclined to do it sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, hey man, if it makes it tighter to the curve, uh, you know, it, there's a good chance we want to try it. But again, um, yeah, I think it's we we want to make sure that all the measurements are correct first before we you know try mm -hmm. to do that. So like in cases like this where you know the green the green is definitively in a gap yeah. to the black gaining up that speaker a little bit actually we can even just do this so height one if i come mm -hmm. back to levels and we go to height one i'm just i'm just throwing this file away so this is all just for science yeah and you can always uh on the adjust settings there's kind of a control z so if you ever are playing with it it's i think it's mm -hmm. right under the arrow um i can't remember the name of what it, how it has it worded um there's a way that goes back to the original file. So there, our dip went away. Yep. All right, and we're pretty, pretty still close to like tracking this line. So that that's like the OCD part of me. It's like oh, I have this flat, this flat line. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I have you haven't tried it both ways in there um, to be able to listen to it. N not to the not to the point of actually like. Yeah, of actually listening to something like this, you're probably really just splitting hairs at, at this point. I would guess to like make these. Tweets. Yeah, if it's you'd probably be pretty hard pressed to be able to tell a difference. Uh, you know, sitting there yeah. listening to it, but yeah, yeah. You know, again, I'm kind of the similar mindset as you, where I want to try to get as close as I can to that line and make it as tight as possible. 
it placates our our uh, mental enjoyment, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, seeing seeing it closer to the line is always more satisfying. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Um, so out of here, so important. I think right before we before you go down to the last step of applying all the features of the software, you want to upload before going to phase. You need your corrections in before you run phase. That's yeah. I mean, generally you can do it. I think either way, but I think they recommend uploading and then doing phase uh, is what I've heard before. Um, but upload then doing phase, and then I go back to quick measure. But uh, you know, phase is. I think the, one of the most impressive tools that Arc has come out with. Um, I think that's really the piece that everybody harped on <laughs> whenever it came out because mm -hmm. no one else does it. And on a mm -hmm. on a simplistic level, you know what what phase alignment is doing is taking your subs, matching them with your front mains, and it takes out a ton of the legwork that you used to have to do with Mini DSP or you know, manually doing it. Um, super great tool. That's a longer part of the process as well, because um, it mm -hmm. checks through like essentially the the entire set of phase angles for all of your subs. So be prepared. That's like a especially with four subwoofers, you can probably go get your cup of coffee after you kick that off. Yeah. Well, it's luckily it's not anything you have to manually do. Right. Uh, yeah. It's is, one click and it does it all. Yeah. It's it's one click and it's going through it. So it's not as long of a process in terms of hey, I got to test this, test this, and see how it all looks. It's just you know hurry up and wait. Yep. <laughs> and then but have you, uh, sets the values too right after it's done. Have you ever manually you know, set up phase before on subwoofers uh, versus having Arc do it and seeing, trying the difference? No, no, I, I haven't. Um, yeah, it's 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 not a, it's definitely not a fun process. Uh, I've seen a lot of people do it. Um, it's not something that I would <laughs> I would recommend doing as much as just having uh, Arc do it. It's a lot less tweaky than REW as well. Yeah, I get a lot of I get a lot of comments on the channel about REW and like you know use REW use REW. It's like I feel like this is pretty good, and I don't have to. It does it for me, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm of the same <clears throat> thought process as well. I mean, I definitely think that REW has its has its place in certain systems. Um, but mm -hmm. for the most part, and these room correction softwares are getting so good and their processing is getting so great that I think that the power of what art can do, um, you know, of course you don't have, you know, as much customization as a, you know, PEQ, but you know, you can pretty much do whatever you need to do, uh, through a platform like this. Yeah, there's a few, I'll probably end up grabbing it to just for a couple of specific things. I'd, I'd really like to run like decay kinds and and like mm -hmm. a few, just to see just to see what my room is doing a few other things but honestly i, I i'm i'm happy <laughs> happy mm -hmm. with the results and uh anybody that's ever come through my room calibrated with this system has been nothing but impressed with uh yeah and again results. right out of the box and you now i feel bad as everybody looks for a you know quick ways to tweak this again just to re <laughs> reiterate everybody's looking for a way to tweak this and say hey i want to be able to adjust this and this and whenever automatically it's doing such a good job um yeah i know that i'm guilty of it too whenever i get a new tv i want to say hey i want to go find these settings on youtube and <laughs> see what people have and try it out and see what works um you know always play with it but what i find is stock tends to work almost the best uh, but the guy like i said the guys anthems know what they're doing yeah so a couple other cool things you can do in here just to highlight it one is you can generate a pdf report essentially mm -hmm. so um there's a lot of a lot of folks uh around some of the owners areas uh facebook and, and, and abs and others where folks like to kind of export their results and talk about and share them and, and try to learn you know from from different results that people are getting and and uh how different rooms are responding and stuff like that. So, that, yep. so you can key. share the PDF as well as save the actual file itself. So you can yep. go in and file save as, um, so that's one thing that, you know, I always say if, if people want more base or if they, again, their room's not feeling like it's got enough of that push to it. Um, yeah. Save as send the file over and someone can edit it, save it, send it back to you. Yep. And then if you do change anything, right, you're only, you're not, you're not impacting the measurements. You're, Correct. You're only kind of impacting your, what is being done 
on top of those. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, if your measure, your measurements going to remain identical, which again, you know, that's why you want to make sure you take the extra time and get that 110% right, because you can go ahead and just you know, play with it a hundred times or, mm -hmm. um, you know, redo a measurement down the road. Um, so once you, uh, you know, even once you're done, you can go back and redo a specific speaker. If you swap out, let's say you swap out your front speakers, you can go through and redo your front speakers at a later time. And then the last part in here, the curve viewer, this is a, a pretty neat visualization tool. You can, um, essentially look at, excuse me, um, between your multiple profiles, between all of your speakers and your subwoofers. Right, you're able to kind of get a visualization of what exactly kind of was was going on. Where, where did where did you start? What is Arc doing by enabling and disabling all of these kind of comparative views, mm -hmm. um, all nicely color coded and labeled and whatnot. So if you really kind of want to dig in, this is a good way to do it to mm -hmm. see what see what what happened. Yeah, and it's always nice to take a look at it once it's done. Um, yeah, and, and then that's where whenever you can go back to Quick Measure as well once you've uploaded it and. Give it a shot. You can go back to Quick Measure and see how it's performing differently. Um, it's another really nice thing to take a look at once it's done. Perfect. And then one other thing that I've seen people talking more about lately is the idea of once you once you you're finished, everything's uploaded, you did your phase, whatnot. About checking your levels. Do you do you do a level check in in any additional <laughs> tweaks or you? So typically, I mean, most of the time, if you've done your measurements correctly, ARC's right on the money. Um, you can go back through, give it a second, give it a second look, just verify it. Um, but for the most part, in my experience, it's 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 right on the money. But still, always check it. Um, make sure that you have a good quality uh, SPL meter. <laughs> uh, if you're going to be doing that, you're not just using your phone because a lot of the times mm. the phones can end up being inaccurate anyways. Um, so check that. Um, don't worry about the distances. Once it's done, don't go in and mess with the distances. Say my subwoofer is not, yeah, it's not 12 feet away. Uh, this is about the actual timing, uh, you know, so the time that it takes to come back to the microphone. So don't mess with that. Definitely take a look at uh, um, at your levels, but they're they're likely going to be on the money. Yeah, here I can pull up the the actual 90 and. actually turned on just to get an idea of kind of what this looks like after we after we upload it mm -hmm. um i do like how it tells you here let me get a little more zoomed in you can always reference in your device which what your arc upload was and and this is actually based on the file name Mm -hmm. um, if if you save it and upload it, it'll it'll carry the file name and you've got your date and time. Um, so if you're never you know if you're unsure about okay which one am I running did I upload what not the information paid of mm -hmm. the device tells you that. And you can toggle whether your your arc files off and so you can kind of hear the difference between it as well under your input settings. Oh, let me turn it on otherwise I won't be able to interact with anything. Yeah, the whole the input structure of these Anthem devices is is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Being able to create and customize them so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I rarely use the uh, the on screen display. Pretty much, this is web GUI is the only way to to typically go with these. But um, yeah, so you're able to toggle your Anthem room correction, which was done there. And so what I always recommend doing is giving it a shot both ways. Um, you know, if you like it better. If you like it better off initially, again, keep it on for a week, turn it off. You know, after a week, you'll probably you know have a change of heart. And for quick, quick swapping, again, you can you can do this so easily. Like if you put your same HDMI sources on different virtual inputs, you don't even have to you don't even have to dig in necessarily. You can just change change the inputs to be able to tweak between these different things or even Right, between different profiles if you're if you set up different profiles to compare something it's mm -hmm. as easy easy as the virtual inputs yep so i've noticed that uh that you also have your uh dolby audio post processing off as well um mm. so what do you think about those 
those different modes? Um, I've never really gotten into uh, on, on any of my gear, like the extra stuff. I guess maybe it's the purest in me. Yeah. Um, so honestly, yeah, I, I can't give a much of a critique. No, that's, that's the exact. So typically on my clients, I recommend having it none. If push comes to shove, use night mode. If, if you absolutely have to, um, you know, just to turn the base down. Cause that's essentially what it does is compressing, mm -hmm. turning base down. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, I don't touch those either. Um, some people have said that the movie mode turns the base up, uh, and they kind of like it, but again, it's not something I would necessarily recommend doing unless, unless you like it, but for the purest, no, don't worry about it. If we take a look at the speaker pane, so this is kind of after you do arc, right? Where you don't want to be, <laughs> where mm -hmm. you don't want to be tinkering. Um, mm -hmm. cause everything in here is set as a result of that upload. Yep. But it's always good to look at it and kind of see what it did. Um, but yeah, going through, you can kind of just take a look and see, which I thought that it would set your subwoofer distances a little bit different, but it's nothing crazy there. Yeah. That's typically where we get the complaint is that the, uh, the subwoofer mm -hmm. distances are way off from where they are because that's just a, uh, longer wave. Yeah. For the most part, the stuff that's, I mean, it, it's pretty, granted the distance it's it's virtual distance essentially right because it's mm -hmm. really more delay than physical distance but yep my results are are evocative of of the physical distance subwoofer one and two are physically further away from three and four mm -hmm. and uh the lcrs of course are also further away than any of the other speakers and i am closest to surround left surround mm -hmm. right um or sorry, yeah, um, and then the in ceilings. My my in ceilings are pretty tight around my couch, just based on where where they had to go in terms of floor joists and soffits and things. So, and have you have you gone back and checked your levels on yours just to see if it was a good reflection? Um, only I I on this config I had only really gone back and played around with measuring the LCRs just in quick measure. Because I was curious what the combined measurement would look like, and that's actually what uh, this one was. Although my screenshot uh, cut off the decibel, but if you look at this, like this is pretty close, or pretty much on with what that yeah. target curve was trying to accomplish. Um, so, but I, I haven't done more of a comprehensive look uh, look through all of it. Here's the crossovers that I was talking about. So the mm -hmm. the in ceilings are are in the 90s um or just, actually sorry just the front in ceilings for whatever reason it comes and which out in ceilings 90s. do you have uh they're the i see not they're not the angled baffles they're the the ones that shoot straight down focal 1000s mm -hmm. same the, the rounds icw six i think is what they are so On six inch yep yeah, um six inch uh mid-range and then they've got the beryllium tweeter like on the stalk mm -hmm. So they are they are still directional, even though the whole baffle isn't isn't angled. Mm -hmm. And I do have everything towed in pretty well in the room right now. That was one of the things after putting the theater chairs in and kind of having a much more definitive main seat. Um, I did did use the angling of of all the speakers actually, kind of directing them more towards towards and around that center center seat. Gotcha. Yeah. makes sense why I would set it to, to 90 Hertz. Um, but the fact that your front and back are a little bit different, um, let's see, cause you're closer to your back speakers, uh, mm -hmm. probably getting a little bit more, how, how close are those to the back wall as well? They're, they're not super close. Um, if I, if I have a good picture in here, Yeah, here's this is kind of a little distorted based on the view. Um, so these are almost kind of more like middle tops than they are truly back tops. This is an older picture as well, obviously, because the couch is there. But my problem is I have this, I have this soffit. So our 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 HVAC room, furnace, water heater, all of that stuff is just on the other side of the wall right here. And we have a geothermal system in the house and they mm -hmm. ran it. They ran it through this room to get out to the backyard where the loops are all buried in the ground. 
-hmm. And so unfortunately, I've got a bunch of big tubes <laughs> pumping fluid um, through the, you know, through the soffit, because uh, we never built this to be a theater. If we had had engineered this space to be a theater from the beginning, it would have been, it would have figured out a way not to do that and would have gotten gotten myself away from the mechanical room a little bit better as well. Um, so we do have like some recessed light cans in there, but I was nervous about putting uh, putting these ceiling speakers in the soffit because of yep. driving up in into those uh, essentially fluid lines for the geo. Mm -hmm. So, um, and even then too, if I would have gone in the soffit, then they would have been very close to the mm -hmm. back wall. Um, and a lot closer to these speakers so the the best position is like almost right where the soffit is um, mm -hmm. but i had to i had to be ahead of the soffit and i had to be ahead of the trim so you know, that's the story of basements i, I primarily yeah. i do a lot of basement designs and so yeah we're constantly working with hvac yeah plumbing all of that it's uh yeah it's just how basements go sometimes yeah and even even the left to right um so the floor joists run in this direction which made it great for wiring because I, I was able to cut these holes. These are basically in the same uh, floor joist, ceiling joist channel, mm -hmm. and they run clear through to the to the wall that I'm shooting from here, which is the screen wall. And on the other side of that wall is where all my gear is. So I was mm -hmm. actually able to pull wire to these speaker positions um, by luck, because if the, if the joist had ran the other direction, I could have never could have never done this conversion of the space so i got completely lucky oh, but the channels great. the channels just outside of these speakers uh i think particularly the the lefts on this side would have been better one more joist over but that's an h that's a duck channel mm -hmm. so it's like you do you get you do what you got to do <laughs> yeah and, and take the limitations that are available as it is i really lucked out that i was able to convert the room so effectively yep yeah, I would rather have a in ceiling speaker that's 16 inches from where it sh ideally should be than no in ceiling speaker at all. Mm. Yeah, I think we had uh, one question on here. It was about the input trim setting. Uh, let's see. Just saw that. Yeah, he said thank you for the live on Arc. Uh, is there it recommended? Go. Yep, is it recommended to? raise the input trim i've noticed higher sound levels so basically what the input trim's doing that's just to overcome the differences between two different inputs so if you have one input that's really loud and one that's quiet you turn the input trim up to uh basically match the quieter one or, or vice versa so it's going to be louder because you're essentially turning up the entire input um another one you know it's another psychological thing we hear louder and we think it's better um mm -hmm. yeah louder is not better you know it's just it's just turning it up louder uh it's, it's, it's really it's doing that's a that's a good question because i see a lot of people that do the exact same thing they they turn it up so like, hey i noticed a noticed a little bit of a difference um but it's just to match your other inputs it's, it's, it's essentially what it's doing julie's had a question from a bit ago as well um thoughts on using arc we kind of really we talked about this a little bit yeah um so. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of being superior, it, they're two different use cases in, in, in some ways. Yeah, for I think ARC, for the average person, I, I prefer it because it's a lot easier for, for the average person. And it's an easier way to, to get, you know, great results and get into the hobby and have a great sounding room. Cool. So I'm very surprised that there hasn't been a there's been a, there been a good good quantity of folks sticking with us through the discussion. Not a not a ton of comments. So if folks have questions, um, I think we've pretty well covered the uh, the, the outline that we had put in place. Um, yeah. So now's your chance, folks. If you have if you have some questions, drop them in, and we'll uh, we'll hit these up. I guess if, unless you have anything else, any capstone thoughts about. Uh... Well, no, I mean, uh, no, I definitely, definitely enjoyed this. And like I said, we, uh, you know, we offer full designs. Typically that's, that's what I'm doing day to day is are, are doing, uh, you know, full floor plans, layouts, like I said, designing basements, 3d renderings, all of that. So uh, yeah, definitely feel free to, uh, to give us a shout. All right. A couple questions flowing in Travis. Um, are the Arndall set for EQ one? I will add delay to the ESP. Um, I I don't remember offhand. 
I don't know much about the the R and Dells. Um, you know, if you generally, if you have DSP inside of your subwoofer, I don't know about the EQ one, what exactly is going on there. But if you yeah. have uh, DSP inside your sub, you are adding delay. But the phase correction on ARC should should fix that. I don't think. Oh, let me reshare this. So they have an app. This probably isn't going to connect from up here. Let's see. I think the so yeah, here's so here is my Arundel config. I, I have reference level turned on. Excuse me, input gain is flat. Yeah, EQ1 is what I'm running. EQ1 sealed, but you have to choose. any of these so i don't think you avoid i i don't think you avoid any any dsp um because you have to have you have to have something selected i don't i think eq1 gives you the most extension um relative to two and three it's been a while since i've looked at this or set it up most everything else in the r dolls is is basically disabled um, i do have the one pe that's the one peq that i had set because on the on the on those lowest frequencies in the measurements, there was that they come across and then it goes peaks and then it then it drops into that valley. And I had been experimenting with kind of cutting off that at least that initial highest highest peak um, in some of the in the PEQ settings. But yeah, so to answer that question anyway, EQ one. Michael's asking. Welcome, Michael. Curious what you guys think of the Genesis mobile app. So I can actually open that here as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a Genesis mobile app. I guess this is the Anthem remote, maybe two different things. Well, so, yeah, so Arc Genesis does have a, they actually have a mobile a mobile app that you can run Arc Genesis on your phone. Um, I I don't necessarily recommend it uh, if you can help it. Uh, yeah, I would definitely try to use a computer if you can get your hands on one uh if you can afford an anthem then go on uh amazon and buy a cheap laptop and run it on there <laughs> if you can uh you're gonna get a yeah. lot better results because your phone requires you to use their you know, the mic on your iphone which is not a calibration mic um yeah it's is it better than nothing not sure uh, I've, i haven't compared it to doing nothing i just from a from a principal level and from the feedback of other people that have run it i would definitely recommend um using a computer I think is the app uh, my my devices are all occupied here. Is the is the app only for the older units as well, or can yeah. you even use it with the new the ABM MRX line? I'm not, not gonna lie, I haven't tried. It. I don't think you can anymore. You used to be able yeah. to do it. And it was only with iPhones, right? Yeah, I think it. I, I want to say from from my prior research anyway. I, I'd never even really considered it, but I I I want to say it. It's it's uh, for prior gen. Yeah, I've, Units. I haven't heard it. I haven't heard it used in a while. The which, mobile app is. Oh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say which exactly what you're what you're showing. The mobile app's nice. Yeah, so you can get in here and do do a lot of um, tweaky stuff. Turn arc on and off. If you want to play with that, you can jump between your inputs and so on. My only challenge, my one challenge that I've had with some of the Anthem gear has been um, some of the network connectivity. And so, like, if I click here, it won't. It won't. This this app will almost. It'll never connect to my STR, and then the STR. You know, some of, some of it's finicky. I actually was talking with Kyle about it at uh, at the Audio Vice Live show, mm -hmm. and um, he mentioned maybe looking at some of the network porting. But like, if I want Genesis to connect to my STR, I have to unplug my Control Four uh, EA Five, and then it then it connects no problem. But if the Control Four is on. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't so it's doing something in the in the network exclusive communication or something or another interesting um, and one other thing while you're on the subject of networks sometimes i've seen this happen where anthem will actually display a different ip than so it typically go mm -hmm. in to get to the you know the web gui and type in the ip address straight in the you know, address bar but sometimes it'll show a different ip you type it up there and it doesn't do anything um and so you have to go into your typically your network and see what's connected to it. Um, mm. Of course, you know, this is if you're Ethernet connected or over Wi-Fi, as long as it's connected to the network and just check and see, just double check it. And usually it's a different IP. I don't know why it happens. Yeah. You know, every once in a while it, it occurs. 
Sea yeah. Goddard's asking, says he lost his original USB cable, just ordered one from Amazon. Any reason to get a replacement from Anthem? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. USB cable should be a USB cable um, for this case, unless it's you know a really long cable with a short in it. <laughs> then, mm. then you should be good. You should be good to go. Yeah, actually, I actually wonder about maybe just grabbing a longer USB C to USB C and not have the. Mm -hmm. the Which I think the Apple dongle should be fine. What I, what I think the issue comes from is whenever you have the the multi, like multi port dongles is what I would imagine a lot of the issues would come from. But the Apple dongles are usually kind of a one to one. Um, they're really reliable. Not sure about this one. Emperor Winfrey saying on his AVM70 has turned his volume 39 before he can hear any sound. That sounds like something might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's it depends on the amplifier. Um yeah, it's hard find... to hard... Okay. Yeah, it's hard to say without looking into it. Um you're yeah, you know, if you run arc, you're definitely gonna know or notice lower volume, but it shouldn't be shouldn't be that low. Mm. I do find from Marantz to Anthem from like the, you know, the negative DB number of the volume, I tend to run the, the Anthem number seems to be more negative at similar volumes. So I think, whereas in, in the Marantz world, I would be like, say with the family watching movies, maybe a minus 15, minus 18, like mm -hmm. minus 25 is where we end up a lot with the Anthem mm -hmm. before I'm told I could go a little more myself. Or I'm told that it's too loud to turn it down. Um, <laughs> yeah, notice volume scaling is of... a funky one because it's, it's really yeah. psychological too. As we pay a lot of attention to the volume scaling, um, yeah. Once that shifts over, you can also switch it over to percentage if if anybody mm -hmm. prefers doing that. It's a cool thing about Anthem, um, but it's very psychological. Again, if yeah, it's hard to say if that's normal or not for your system, depending on the amplifier and depending on the speaker. Um, but for the most part, you know, those are the things you want to look at. Mark's asking, what do you think about running a new ARC measurement with each firmware update? I, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, measurements, I, I, don't, I can't imagine that they're going to change the measurement methods. If they do, then they'll probably announce, announce that in some type of patch note or something along those lines. But mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't change anything with the measurements. Yeah, I would agree. Just keep an eye on the, on the patch notes if, if there's mm -hmm. something specific. Um, amp a recommendation question here, Oprah as well. Any thoughts? Speakers, ninety-two dB sensitive amps. Do you like? Do you like? Do you like the Anthem amps? I never heard or I used the Anthem amps. amps. Yeah. I love their amps. Yeah, the MCA, the MCA series is absolutely fantastic. I spec those out for a ton of theaters, um, especially you know if I can throw in three MCA five twenty fives with an AVM ninety, looks really nice on top of that. But they they sound fantastic. Um, 92 decibels of sensitivity, it should be fine. You're going to have a lot of headroom with it, which there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, per listen speakers he's got specifically. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't have any issue with that whatsoever. It's better to have more power than too little. This is a good point as well. Oprah uses, says we use the web on his phone. If you go to the IP address of your AVM, MRX, et cetera, on a mobile device, you will get like a mobile web view, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. It's very basic. Uh, the mobile, the app will be nicer when the app comes out of beta and they formally launch it, but that, mm -hmm. that you can still do that now and it works. You can navigate, you can get to everything and you, and you can, you can do that. So not specifically Anthem question, MTM percussion, are there ways to use a better mic for Odyssey? enabled ABRs? Well, I don't think there, I don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there are, um, mm. you know, typically we go with stock on those. I know you can for Dirac, um, you know, because they allow different calibration files. That's the thing is with Odyssey, I don't think you can upload different calibration files. If you're talking about just running it on the AVR, um, I don't think there's going to be a real way to do that. Perfect. Travis had another comment. He tried several dongles and the Apple was, uh, What's his preferred one? Yeah. yeah, stuff like that. I always they're a little more expensive than just buying whatever Amazon basics, but I I tend to stick to the mm -hmm. Apple cables too. Yeah, first party for for their computers, it tends to work the best. I'm a Mac guy myself. 
getting an M3. <laughs> Just announced those yesterday. Uh, I know. I know. I saw it. I was <clears> like, well, oh. the thing is, I feel like no matter what, I'm, I'm going to be behind with Apple's laptops. And it's not <laughs> something I can go and really trade it in as easily. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'm still rocking the my... M1. Yep. Same. M M1 Pro 16 inch. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. I think we've exhausted the questions. We covered a ton and we're past an hour and a half. I think uh, we might be able yeah. to call it a night here. Awesome. Well, if you guys have any questions, um, yeah, audio advice or audioadvice.com has our chat and uh, call function. So feel free to chat on our website. Um, yeah, we're always happy to answer any questions you got. Same thing with uh, with phones. Call in. Yeah, feel free to give us a ring. And also, I have a uh, you know a section for free consultations. So for if you're doing a new theater project, feel free to you know sign up for a consultation. Uh, we can get you the after this is done. We can probably put the calendar link down in the uh, or the uh, <laughs> the section of that down in the comments. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out. There's a there's a link to the. That'll go to the audio advice webpage to, to fix my backgrounds. And if you call these guys, mention tech enthusiasm. Yeah, <clears throat> please do. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, we'll be back probably next week again, if not the week after. Stay tuned to the channel. All kinds of content coming. Um, I just got some brand new NADs in, um, some other videos on its way, some more, more, more things happening in the enthusiasm home theater for the end of 2023 so we'll be back be back soon thanks awesome thanks guys